Oh, Dave, it's interesting that you mentioned Jack Ramsden there because we don't hear much about Jack Ramsden anymore, but of course he was a contemporary of Barney's and he would have been uh, probably putting the fear of God up you lot when, you, when he was having a bet. So what do you remember about him? Jack Ramsden was one of the cleverest men that I've met in, uh, in the betting industry, in the betting game. He was a very, very clever punter. And him and Colin, as bookmaker and punter, formed a bond to the point where Colin did a lot of business for Jack. I'm sure not all the business, but he did a lot of business. Um, I think we first came across him. Um, Jack had a horse called Flight of Time that was trained by Barry Hills. And um, the horse won at Ripon. It's many, many, many years ago. Um, it then, uh, this will get the year for people who are watching. It then went on to be beaten up at Carlisle by a horse called Teleprompter that was trained by Bill Watts that went on to win a Royal Hunt Cup. Um, and Jack thought a lot of flight of time. He even backed it to beat Teleprompter that day and it did finish second to it. And Teleprompter proved itself to be a great horse. But yeah, very clever man. Big value punter. Didn't back favourites. Back big prior horses. He was ahead of his time. I think he worked on times. And I think a lot of people work on times now and average times for different distances, going allowances at different tracks. Jack got that way before everybody else. And horses that he found back then to back were double priced figures, 12, 14, 16 to 1 chances. Now, there are a lot of people finding similar horses based on times and they're nowhere near those prices anymore. The 72, 41 chances. As we both know, Simon, you don't need to back too many 14 to 1 chances to make the game pay, whereas you've got to back a lot more 4 to 1 winners to make the game pay. So, yeah, a man that was ahead of his time, great admiration for him. Whenever he had a bet with Colin, and Colin would add his own money too, I added mine. In fact, my first house, um, which was a lovely cottage, two, two little cottages that I converted into one, the whole development was funded by Jack's tips. <laughs> now, there's another Ramsden that was quite famous back in the day. I'm guessing you probably didn't follow his bets in. T.P. Ramsden, no. Um, Terry Ramsden obviously became very well known because of the size of bets that he um, was having at the time. I think, um, from memory, um, one of the bookmakers he used, other than Hills and Ladbrokes, was um, a northern bookmaker called Michael Garrity. Um, some of his brother's family are still on course, um, Andrew Garrity and Paul Garrity, um, in very good pictures, um, from Cheltenham to Ascot and to many of the northern tracks. But Michael used to bet next to um, Colin on the rails virtually everywhere. And from being a reasonably good bookmaker, very quickly, when Terry got involved and he decided to take him on, he became a very big bookmaker. And I think um, on the back of Terry Ramsden, they made quite a lot of money. So we, this is going to be like, we've only got four parts. So can you give us a couple of your favourite memories from the, from the race course? So many memories. Um, characters, Johnny Lights. Um, they were just punters. They, were, they worked, they all worked in a similar vein. There were a lot of leads back then. The leads have disappeared. Exchanges mean that a lot of people who are clever sit at home and nobody knows what they're doing. They're playing on the exchanges. Back then, if you wanted a big bet, there were a lot of bookmakers who were out there that were going to oblige. So people with connections came to have a bet. And people like Johnny Lights, Dudley, Rodley, D Dudley Roberts, who was another great character, um, they would follow people around in the ring and join in. It was amazing to see people with nothing other than a newspaper tucked under their arm, Racing Chronicle, Sporting Life, now the Racing Post, turn up at the races and make a living just by latching on to who was doing what. And that was one of Colin's big things. He said, you're not just there, Brewer, to move money around and hedge bets for me. Everything you see, I want you to report back to me. I need to put that into the computer and then I can work out whether I want to be a bookmaker on this race or a punter. And many times Colin turned from being a bookmaker to being a punter. If all the pieces of the jigsaws, he called it, fell into the right place, he'd become a punter.
And would Terry Ramsden bet with you guys? No. He bet with the big firms and he bet with the Garretys. He was a losing punter overall. I don't think I'm saying anything that nobody doesn't know. And as such, there wasn't any edging of his money. They just, they call it playing it top of the book. What that means is you're not trying to build a book around it. You're just taking a man on head to head. And I think Ladbrokes did that, Hills did that. And then Garrity, when he started doing business, um, also did that. So no, he had his bookmakers and we weren't one of them. Now, everybody knows about the high profile that we've just talked about. But even from my days of working on course, there was always a couple of small punters. If they came in and had a bet, that would be just as significant. Can you remember many of those? There was a, a guy called Terry Kirk. He ran out the Midlands. I think in his day he was a very good friend of Piggott's. But Terry had a man who nobody ever got to know that did a card that was a winning card. And Terry, I think, sold that card and tissue. A tissue is, is what we a forecast prices. So way before computers formulated the markets, which they now do with the exchanges, somebody had to start putting prices on the board. And various bookmakers, Colin included, paid what we called um, tissue price markers to give us a forecast price for each race. And obviously then through the flow of money or lack of it, odds would change. Um, Terry sold the tissue that he got from Mr Anonymous um, to various bookmakers in the South. And I'm almost certain from my memory banks that one of them was Michael Tabor. Michael Tabor got the tissue. But it wasn't just a price tissue, it was a, a form opinion as well. And there were a lot of people made money from that card. Um, as I say, I knew Terry spread it out into the market, but I don't know who the man behind it was. Terry would never give that up. Terry was a character. Because it was Neil Wilkins in the safe used to sell his. You get he the did. Care, you get the careful's indeed. and, yeah. the, and yeah. being the little huddle around. And the southern bookmakers always go so quick that you couldn't keep up and then give you a cuss if you, can, if you ask them to do it again. But. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and going back to the Garretys and Terry Ramsden, Michael Garrity at that time had a professional punter called Chris Spencer who had a golden run. He did his own prices. He went to look at the horses in the paddock. He watched the horses go down. He was ex time form as was some very clever people that filtered onto the track. Timeform must have been a great breeding ground for guys that were really interested in racing, number one, but who were clever, who were really clever and came up with their own handicapping systems. Um, David Haig was another one. In fact, Chris Spencer and David Haig worked for John Banks when John Banks first left Scotland and went down south and had his own um, racing paper that gave up tips. Um, and then John became a legendary bookmaker and, and punter, as we know. But yeah, Chris Spencer was tied up with Michael Garrity and they had a golden run um, of backing winners and laying losers. Chris had a good opinion both ways, but he didn't fancy the look of one in the paddock, didn't like the way it had gone to post, didn't think it moved over the ground correctly that day and it was a favourite, a short price favourite, they'd take a stripe out of it. And they were more right than wrong. And to do, be able to do that in those days, they'd need a friendly bookmaker to take their, to take their few quid out of it for them. That's they? right, that was his connection with Michael Garrity. And how many punters appeared and appeared to be to have a be Mystic Meg's son or whatever and back winner after winner and then just knock themselves out? I mean, did they, you see any sort of glory um, sort of go down in flames? So, too many to mention. It's a funny, it's a funny, life's a funny game, but racing is, is a mirror of life. People have a streak of luck and you think, is this guy a genius or are they just on a, on a lucky run? Well, as the story unfolds, you very quickly learn whether they're very clever and they're consistent at backing winners or they've just had a lucky run and it goes the other way. I've seen some real su overnight success stories turn into uh, losing punters that have walked off the track with a tail between their legs. Did you, it's did a great you, level of racing. Did you quite often see it coming where the stakes only gone up from a bottle to a monkey to a grand to five grand? Chasing was always a sign of a, of, a, of a losing punter. A man who was a £200 punter and backed his winners never increased his bets. But when he started losing, it was amazing how he increased them to try and win his money back. And that's when the writing for me was on the wall, when a man started increasing his stakes for no logical reason. 
And you mentioned some trainers earlier. Would there have been any particular trainers that you would all hop off the stool and follow in? Um, King Hon, um, Alan King Hon used to work for um, Playboy um, before he came out on his own. I believe Victor Lounza was sent over um, by Hugh Hefner to look for opportunities in gambling in the UK. Um, came across Alan Kinghorn when he worked for a firm called Heathorns. Michael Heathorn, who had a bookmaking presence off course and on course. Um, and Kinghorn tells some great stories of um, when he worked for Heathorn. Paul Cole, Dick Hearn, really good trainers. When they put their money down, everybody wanted to follow them. Guy Harwood, some really, really clever people. Not big players either. But when they put their own money down, horses that they trained, people joined in. Now, you used to bet, obviously, in the big meetings at the North, but Colin would come down, as you mentioned, Cheltenham, Royal Ascot, yeah. Goodwood. What, which were the strongest meetings? Colin bet, in his day, from Air in Scotland down to Goodwood on the South Coast, we travelled as a team between 80 and 90,000 miles a year for those 31 years. The festivals were where the money came came out. So from the Gold Cup meeting up in Air, um, which is in September, down through York in August, down to Ascot, Epsom, all the big meetings to Goodwood in August, that's where you saw huge amounts of money. The run of the mill meetings, you only saw a big bet when somebody knew a bit more than you. Now, you, your job on the rails, you mentioned doing Tic Tac, obviously the Tic Tac thing sort of died when the walkie talkies came in and that sort of stuff. What, what, what would you say your most important role on the firm was? Was it like a spotter or a get a backer on her or what, what was it? It was a dual role. Um, for me, it was moving money, it was edging money, but alongside that, it was letting Colin know what was going on in areas of the ring that he couldn't see. What amount, where the money was going and who was placing that money. Not everybody went straight to the likes of Colin and Stephen Little to have a bet. They used to move around the ring. So if I saw something that Colin hadn't seen, it was important for me to let Colin know that Joe Bloggs was having a bet and it was a fairly decent bet and it was with the trainer that he's connected with. And Colin put all that into his own computer, as he used to say, looking for the jigsaw pieces. Now, was it is a very highly charged, even the little bookmakers I used to work for is very you know you get pretty stressed at times and a bit tense and stuff Would, was it ever run of the mill for you or was it always that edgy you know every day was an exciting day working for Colin Webster was an exciting place to be he took on big punters he played at the top end of the game both as a bookmaker and a punter there was a lot of information th flowed through Colin um, and as such I became a backer of horses as well there wasn't a bad day at the office. Colin was cool, he was calm, he was collected. You would never know, ever, whether he'd won or lost. He was unbelievable in the heat of the moment. And that spread off him to his staff. Nobody seemed to, to lose control of what we were there to do. And I hope that that's how I've tried to be since. Uh, and was, you, so you mentioned that you had a... a bought two houses, locked them in together off, off the back of some winnings. So was ultimately your job with Colin secondary to your punting? Yeah. I mean, Colin always looked after me. He treated me like a second son. I think the whole racing world knows that. Um, but there's only so much you can pay anybody in any role. I had a company car. I had health, um, health insurance with him. We went away on holiday. I didn't just work for Colin. We were friends, really good friends. But the information that we got to know for a substantial period of those 32 years enabled me to more than triple, quadruple my salary every year.